Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us in SFPL's virtual library, i.e. Zoom. Today, artist Chip Lord chronicles his lifelong involvement with the automobile from childhood fascination to the central material of art making with the group Ant Farm and beyond. Ant Farm was an avant-garde architecture, graphic arts, and environmental design practice founded in San Francisco in 1968 by Chip Lord and Doug Michaels. This visual lecture by Chip Lord was first given in the graduate lecture series at the SF Art Institute and then at the Toledo Art Museum during the exhibition, Life is a Highway, Art in American Car Culture 2019. The San Francisco Public Library hosts hundreds of programs a month system-wide. They are all free to log in and or attend in person always. Programming consists of film viewings, tech, job, and financial coachings, knitting circles, storytelling workshops with the opera, book clubs, author lectures, instructor-led arts and crafts classes, etc. This month we highlight and celebrate more than a month. SFPL's celebration of Black history and futures. In the chat, we'll post SFPL's upcoming events link so you know what's happening soon at your library. We'll also post our YouTube channel link where you can watch other outstanding library programs. Before we get started with our current program, we've got a bit of housekeeping to do. First and foremost, land acknowledgement. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Rame Tushaloni peoples, who were the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. As uninvited guests, we affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples and wish to pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Rame Tush community. For more information on SFPL's Rame Tush Ohlone land acknowledgement, please see the link posted in chat. This program has been sponsored by the Friends of the Library and brought to you by the Art, Music, and Recreation Center of the San Francisco Public Library. You can visit us at the main library, fourth floor, and may contact us at the email and our phone number provided here. We'll drop our homepage link in the chat. Here are some books available at SFPL by and about Chip Lord and Ant Farm. We'll post this list via Art, Music, and Recreation Center blog in the chat. Enjoy it all for free at your library. Chip Lord grew up in 1950s America, a place that has been a sometimes source of inspiration in his work as an artist. Trained as an architect, he was a founder, founding partner of Ant Farm, with whom he produced the video art classics Media Burn and The Eternal Frame, as well as the public sculpture Cadillac Ranch in Amarillo, Texas, and the House of the Century outside Houston, Texas. His work crosses between documentary and experimental boundaries and moves between video, photography, and installation. Chip Lord's work has been exhibited and published widely and is included in collections of Museum of Modern Art, the Tate Modern, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the FRAC Center, the Pompidou Center, and the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. He is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Film and Digital Media, UC Santa Cruz, and has also taught in architecture at CCA and Columbia University GSAPP. He, he lives in San Francisco and we'll uh, post his website in the chat. Lastly, the rules. All participants will remain muted during the presentation and 10 to 15 minutes will be reserved at the end of the presentation for Chip to answer questions that are posted in the Q&A. Library related or other, please use chat. This presentation will be recorded. We have enabled auto transcription if you need closed captioning on your screen. You can remove it from your screen by clicking the CC button. So wel uh, welcome Chip and thank you for being here. And I'll share, I'll stop sharing my screen and, and hand it over to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Um, and thank you everyone for coming out on this cold, windy day in San Francisco. Uh, I know you, you, you didn't actually come out, I know that. Um, I'm going to go right to uh, my, sharing my screen and starting the presentation. I don't have a, that was a wonderful introduction and, uh, 
I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, this is the long goodbye to the automobile 2023 version. And, um, you know, in, a, in another sense, it's an uh, artist uh, talk, and I'm going to show uh, eight projects uh, today. Doug was the co-founder of Ant Farm, and he died in 2003. Uh, it's National Black History Month, and I wanted to start with this uh, image. It's a shot from the uh, series Cars and Owners that Doug and I did within, sort of within Ant Farm, without it being an Ant Farm project. But um, this was shot in 1973. We were in Houston near the University of Houston, and uh, this gentleman. Uh, we asked permission to take his picture, which we did, and you see it here. It was made into a postcard and um, eventually became part of the Cars and Owners uh, series, which is 160 35 millimeter slides uh, that uh, Doug and I took. We don't know which of us took any <laughs> particular one, but uh, we're going to come back to that project. <clears throat> A little bit later. I'm going to start with uh, some personal history. I was born in 1944 and it was a year in which there were no cars manufactured in the U.S. because uh, the war, World War II was, in, in, uh, was going on and all the manufacturing capacity of the automobile industry had been turned over to um, producing uh, tanks and planes and other uh, weaponry. So when the war ended in 1945, it still took uh, a few years for the automakers to come out with new models. It took typically three years. And uh, for Ford, it was introducing uh, the 1949 Ford. Uh, and my dad bought a car, bought exactly this car. So I was just five years old when that car came into the family. Um, <clears throat> The 1949 Cadillac, it was advertised uh, thus, and this is probably from a Life magazine ad, uh, the new standard of the world. Of course, standard of the world was the Cadillac motto. So this was a new version of that. And in a way that was the introduction to uh, a decade in which uh, car styling uh, held power over uh, the advertising of the cars and the uh, creating sales incentives for various models. This is a 59 uh, Cadillac also from a, from a brochure. This is, an, this is also a 59 Cadillac. It's interesting. Uh, this is an ad for uh, Body by Fisher. So it's a division of General Motors. And uh, for some reason, the illustrator cut off the engine, the front of the car, and the, there's no wheels, it's being launched into space, which I think is maybe has something to do with the Sputnik era, but it's, but it's, the, uh, it's the tail fin era. And uh, it wasn't just General Motors that was pursuing this idea, but uh, uh, also Ford and Chrysler. And, uh, and actually uh, in this ad, um, I don't know if you can read, you probably can't read the text, but it says, an uh, excerpt would say, uh, based on aerodynamic principles, uh, tail fins make a real contribution to the remarkable stability of these cars on the road. I don't think that's true. That's a 59 uh, Dodge uh, owned by a local collector. So I'm going to jump forward a little bit forward in time in my personal history. I, in 1962, I went to Tulane University School of Architecture and I began studying architecture. And in a magazine, I saw the, this rendering of the Boston City Hall, um, which was the winner of a competition. And the, the, the a young architecture firm, Coleman, McKenna, and Knowles, there were actually three um, professors or two professors and a student at Columbia, they won the competition and it took uh, six years for the building to be completed. That happened to be the same duration. It took me six years to <laughs> complete my training as an architect. And of course, uh, by the time I did graduate, um, 
I was a little bit less interested in being an architect, but I, I got in my uh, Volkswagen Beetle and uh, headed to California to participate in the uh, Halperin workshop. Um, this, this is a photo from uh, taken at the Sea Ranch. Uh, it was a collective workshop for dancers and architects. And um, I think to me, it introduced uh, the ideas that the city could be an object, the city could be a score, and moving through the city as a form of performance, uh, to summarize in, in, in three lines, the help and workshop. After the, it was a 30 day workshop. So it was basically the month of, of July. And uh, after the workshop, Doug Michaels, I met him uh, the previous fall when he came to Tulane on a, a lecture tour. He had graduated a year earlier and he had some of his uh, student work shown in Progressive Architecture magazine. And that was enough for him to get on the phone and call around and set up this lecture uh, trip. And we'd stayed in touch over that time. And uh, he came out to San Francisco and we were um, having conversations about alternatives, uh, forms of architecture. And we described it uh, to, to a friend who was visiting one night uh, that we were gonna be underground architects because you had in the city at that time, underground newspapers, underground films, uh, underground uh, music. There was a sense of an underground culture emerging. And she immediately said, oh, like the toy I had, the ant farm. Uh, I had that as a kid. Uh, and it was a perfect metaphor. And instantly, not only did we have a name, but we also had uh, an official color, which was green, because ant farms only came <laughs> in green in those days. And what you see here is a rendering of the ant farm. You had to send in a coupon to get your ants, but the ants seem to be building more interesting biomorphic spaces below ground. Uh, and above ground, we see a rather really conventional mid 20th century agrarian uh, piece of, couple of pieces of architecture. It was also a good name for a band, and probably that's what we really wanted to do, is be a rock band. Um, but none of us knew how to play any instruments. And at the time, we didn't realize that that probably wouldn't have been a detriment to the success of the band. But um, I wanted to just quote uh, Michael Storkin here on the naming of uh, Anthem. He said that, Calling their collaboration, Ant Farm immediately signaled that the work would be of a different order than that produced under the gray flannel and premature of a firm such as Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill. True, totally true. And, uh, you know, today many architectural firms try to find a name that is not simply the name of the partners. So I think we were influential over the long. Paul uh, in that sense. And the, the group expanded over the next few years. Uh, we taught at the University of Houston in 1969 and uh, made friends with some of the students there who were like-minded. And um, it, it led to after oh, a total of five years since the founding, but uh, it led to a commission that became the Cadillac Ranch in 1974. And it was this guy, uh, Stanley March III, who we met in uh, the, at the end of 1973, uh, returning uh, from Texas back to California. He invited us to visit and we met him. And as we were getting ready to leave, he said, would you, if you have an idea for a project, I would, uh, you know, that I might do with you, I, I'm, I'm interested. So we went back to California and then we sent him basically this uh, blueprint. The original was a blueprint. This is a reproduction. And what's interesting, you know, looking back on it now, it's, it's uh, I think Doug Michaels drew this, but the section through the grave site, the architectural form, the section drawing, the plan below it, there's a, a budget 
then uh, we, we budgeted, for example, uh, $3,000 to purchase 10 uh, vehicles to fulfill this idea. It was the literal uh, making in three dimensions of a diagram that we had uh, seen in a book called The Design of Cars. And um, the three of us, uh, Lord Marquez and Michaels, had all shared this growing up obsession with automobiles. And in fact, at one point we, we realized that uh, our fathers only got as far as automobile in the hierarchy of the idea being, first you buy the affordable Chevrolet, then you go to Pontiac, then you go to, uh, I'm not, I'm just never sure whether it was Buick or Olds. But in other words, our dads never got to the success level to own a Cadillac. <laughs> and Stanley uh, gave us a go ahead and said, let's plan uh, a trip on, why don't you come down here to Amarillo and we'll start buying uh, cars for the Cadillac Ranch. And so what you see here, uh, a shot of me handing a check to a used car salesman on the left, I think it's the left. <laughs> and then the other shot, I'm in a junkyard uh, with two hands on two different uh, model Cadillacs from the 50s, the 58. And that was the one that was actually purchased in turquoise and uh, a 55 uh, is the other car. And um, once we had the 10 cars lined up uh, and ready to go, we started construction with the backhoe because the ground was very, uh, very hard in, on the site. The site is on, technically on Interstate 40, about eight miles west of the Amarillo city limits, or, or it was at that time. And if, if you can dig the uh, 10 holes that are the same depth and the same width, all you have to do is push the cars in and they will line up. So it only took a week to construct uh, the sculpture, and then we had an opening reception party, which is uh, was on the summer solstice in 1974, and uh, this photo was taken uh, then. We didn't uh, provide any explanation, no signage, no uh, you know. Uh, headstone that would have the credits or describe what it was. And that was Stanley Marsh's idea. We agreed with it. And uh, so what you see in this picture taken a year later is the sort of the sense of the distance from the sculpture back to the highway. There's actually a, uh, a access road and then the interstate, it's interstate 40. And you can see that the cars are in pretty good shape after one year, um, the, the glass is broken and these two cars, but uh, the paint is all original. 1981, uh, the graffiti is beginning and you can see the pathway. There's been a number of visitors uh, who've uh, made a pathway out to Cadillac Ranch. And then 1984, the 10th anniversary, basically up until this point in time, people would take out their car key and scratch into the paint, you know, either a message or a signature or something like that. And the, uh, the idea of spray paint is kind of just beginning at this point in time. We never envisioned that. We did have the hubcaps welded on because we could imagine people might steal uh, hubcaps, but, um, no other, and we did weld the doors closed and so forth, but already somebody has um, absconded with the, the uh, trunk uh, lid. Um, there were 10th, 20th, and 30th anniversaries every 10 years on the summer solstice. But Stanley Marsh died in uh, just before 2000. 14, and um, that was the last party there. 
over this period of time, it was uh, what was interesting was that we had an agreement with Marsh. Uh, and the agreement was this the Marsh family would always own the property and the physical uh, sculpture itself, but the ant farm would own the image rights. So we had been engaged in trying to <laughs> police the image rights. And since access was given to uh, the property for the public, it's really a public sculpture, but it's privately owned and on private land. So by, by 2015, the, uh, so many people have been tagging it that, uh, you know, here's, uh, here's somebody holding a slab of paint that has been peeled off one of the cars. You can see the kind of thickness of the paint. And <clears throat> um, a couple of years later, um, we were contacted we had, by Acne Studio. It's a design, a European design company and a, a fashion retailer. And they wanted to do, do a photo shoot for which they paid a, 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 a fee. And this is a shot of Cindy Crawford standing next to the 59 Cadillac, which they also requested. It, could we paint it black? And we said, sure, why not? Um, so. That was the project number one. And number two, um, Media Burn was done uh, a few years later, but also has a car at the center of the project. It all ha also happens to be a 59 Cadillac. But I wanted to begin with this image because it shows that it was Media Burn was done before a live audience of invited, um, of an invited public. We sent out a postcard that said, um, this postcard will admit a car load in the classic sort of drive-in movie uh, mode. And it was very simple to create, you know, this, essentially this image, um, this is a Diane Hall photo, uh, but we had a press area set up and sort of held the public back. And, and we populated the press area with many friends who were photographers, but um, in this photo, you can see the San Francisco Chronicle reporter on the far right and um, another photographer. And um, so the, the car was at the center of it and it took about a year to um, customize and reconfigure uh, the car, which we had purchased as a company car. We actually bought it from somebody who was in the Hoodoo Rhythm Devils. And uh, we bought it in 1973, uh, a local band. And the idea was to make a version of the dream car of the 50s. Uh, this is the Firebird 3 from General Motors shown in front of the Gen uh, GM Tech Center. Uh, but this sketch shows, um, it was an early sketch, January 1973, that the um, idea of the project was sort of all components were there, although the model car, the make of the car changed and uh, uh, for any number of reasons. But the idea of integrating video and then making it a critique of the, like the monolith of the three, you know, television corporations, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Um, it's about breaking that monolith <laughs> symbolically, naively, maybe. Um, and um, the, the project then, once taken, once made, uh, it was videotaped. Uh, incidentally, all the vi several video crews, they were all volunteers. And as were the photographers, uh, this is a John F. Turner photo that was made into a postcard. And the distribution of the project was by both videotape and edited videotape and also uh, a postcard. Uh, that being the least expensive way to uh, communicate through the mail. Eventually uh, more than 100,000 postcards were um, in distribution. And um, I don't know, three years ago, uh, Steve Side wrote this manuscript uh, 
about the making of an image. And it's very complete and tells the whole story in detail. And that's readily available. It'll be at the uh, art book fair this summer at Minnesota Street Project. And that's Media Burn. The third project of uh, the Citizens Time Capsule was actually done the same year, uh, 1975. And uh, it was done at uh, Art Park in Lewiston, New York. It's a public park. At that time, the, uh, the uh, curators at Art Park were inviting artists there were a number of artists working in the area of using natural materials and, you know, can, uh, doing site specific work. But the thing was, Art Park uh, had a rule that you came for a residency and you made work, but it couldn't be permanent work. It would be, you'd either take it with you or it would be destroyed at the end of the summer. So we, uh, we proposed a, a time capsule that would be in uh, a late, not, maybe not so late model station wagon. And we would invite citizens of the area of Lewiston to make donations for the time capsule. And, um, and, and ultimately we bought a Oldsmobile 67, I think, Oldsmobile Vista Cruiser station wagon. It was a perfect uh, vehicle because it had that sort of skylight like a Greyhound bus uh, details. And these 25 or so suitcases, which were on display for two weeks, and uh, Doug Michaels was sitting at a card table at our park inviting people uh, to make donations. All, all of this moving towards uh, burying the, the car, the time capsule, as a way of circumventing the idea that the work would disappear at the end of the summer. In other words, the art park uh, curators accepted this idea that it wouldn't be visible during its, um, what was planned to be a 25 year uh, entombment. And we wanted to come back to art park in the year 2000 and, and bring it up. That was the concept. Um, th this is a photo of the citizens who showed up for the uh, closing event, September 15th, 1975, and a detailed shot of how the suitcases were filled and then used as a way to categorize the uh, images and articles. Uh, so you've got, uh, you know, over-the-counter drugs and cigarettes and condoms in the front row and then uh, a survey from a newsstand and souvenirs of the bicentennial the following year. Uh, and um, we, because we had to go out and commercially <laughs> supplement what the citizens uh, donated, we went to a Kmart. Uh, so <clears throat> after some speeches, the, local, the mayor came, uh, the car was, this is part of the terrain of Art Park. It was, we didn't have to lower the car into a, a tomb. It could be dug into a hillside and that way the car could be even, even possibly driven, although I think it was just pushed uh, into the site. Uh, and then um, a uh, kind of roofing repair uh, material was applied over the car and the, uh, Two cases were wrapped in two plastic garbage bags and put in the car. And there were other precautions taken for the longevity uh, to protect the vehicle until the year 2000. But, you know, what happened was when 2000 rolled around, there was no interest in uh, unearthing uh, the citizens' time capsule. So it remains underground to this day. Um, so now I'm going to show some post ant farm uh, works. Uh, this is my Honda 600 coupe from uh, Self Portrait 1977. Um, and I had also done the drawing on the left, a uh, list of cars I've owned so far. It was 18 at that point. I was uh, approaching my 40th birthday. And uh, 
last year I thought it'd be interesting to go back and then update it with a with a you know a, a similar formatted um, drawing. So the fourth project is the Chevrolet training film, um, the remake, and um, <clears throat> the project that uh, I I did uh, just after the end of. And Farmer 1978 with Phil Garner. Uh, Phil Garner has since changed his name to uh, Pippa and changed his pronouns from male to female. And but at that time he was the uh, he he was also a, a car obsessed artist and um, qu quite a good uh, actor and performer really. And so he played the salesman. Uh, in the remake of a film that we purchased at the Alameda flea market. It was a film that was made to train a uh, young Chevrolet salesman and would be distributed by General Motors through, you know, uh, all the local dealerships. Um, we did several live performances in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Houston that I, I can remember. Um, I was the the buyer. I played the buyer of the car. In the original film, uh, it was an amateur actor who played the buyer, and it was an actual salesman named uh, Bob Warner. And we were invited in 1981 to come to the Whitney Museum and do it as do a live performance, and then also an installation where the video we videotaped the live performance, and then. Uh, the uh, the videotape play for another two weeks, but while we were there, we um, did the research, calling up the original uh, Chevrolet dealership within uh, Hicksville, Long Island, and uh, Phil Garner was married at the time. His wife Nancy Reese called them and asked if if Bob Warner was still selling cars there, and somebody said, "Well, I think he's moved. I think he's selling Cadillac now in Manhattan." So he had moved up, but we were able to contact him and invite him to come to the Whitney Museum and see the uh, remake of that film, his only film that he had performed in, in 1961. That's the Chevrolet training film, the remake. Number five, Cars and Owners. Uh, a kind of casual, obsession to start documenting friends uh, with their cars. Uh, and these two shots are from 1972. The uh, Marilyn Ochman was a client and we were uh, designing and building a house for her outside of Houston at the time. Uh, ben Holmes was one of the workers on that project. Chip Lord and Doug Michaels. Uh, Doug always liked to have a suit and be the uh, play the role of the straight guy uh, in the group. He was far from it. Um, but what was sort of a casual project to just document uh, friends and acquaintances? Uh, at some point, we realized, well, it's maybe it's more than that. You know, maybe it should be a specific photo series. And um, these are two shots I took after the end of Ant Farm in the early 80s. Of course, Spain Rodriguez, the San Francisco underground uh, comic uh, artist on the left, and Susan Suttle, uh, who passed away a couple of years ago with her Plymouth Valiant. She, I think, even introduced me to Spain, the connection in that. Photo. So it's 160 images. I'm just showing the these samples. Um, here is uh, I'm in front of my uh, T-bird at the sculpture garden of the Berkeley Art Museum uh, for the premiere of the film Motorist, and then uh, Doug in the late 80s in Los Angeles with his Volvo. Project six, uh, Save the Planets. Um, this is the Cadillac Ranch derivative project. And um, in the photo here, Peter Morton is flanked by uh, Hudson Marquez, myself, and Doug 
Michaels. And he called us one day and we had, had not been working together for almost 10 years at that point. And uh, he said, I, I'm building a new Hard Rock Cafe in Houston. I'd like to commission you to do an artwork for the front of it. Um, the Cadillac Ranch had been perceived as being a negative idea, <laughs> you know, bury the gas guzzlers. And although that may be part of it, it's not all of it. But it led us to think, well, if we're going to do something for the Hard Rock Cafe, let's do it op something optimistic, you know, uh, in nature. And the only car that you could imagine being launched into space is the 61, 62, 63 Ford Thunderbird uh, model. And so you're seeing a conceptual sketch on the left um, of this project was pretty much built just exactly as the sketch portrayed it. Um, Hard Rock Cafe is known for um, marketing its t-shirts and sweatshirts and various things. And do you think that a, a display case uh, in the foot of the sculpture might have those products in it, but instead we wanted to fill it with petroleum-based products, including STP, Tide, and other laundry, you know, petroleum-based laundry products. And um, we, uh, we luckily had a friend who was working for an architect that was the local architect for the project, and it was able to coordinate with them for all the architectural details and, and get this project built in 1986. But then uh, capitalism being what it is, uh, the Hard Rock Cafe was sold to new owners. They wanted to move it to downtown uh, center of Houston and the building was abandoned. And at that point, a sign company came out and took down what was considered a sign uh, in 19, around 1992. I don't know the exact date. End of STP. The seventh project, Motorist, um, in some ways is a adaptation from a book that I, I did the text. I wrote it in 1976. It was published by E.P. Dutton. It was um, they made the mistake of placing it in the automotive section of bookstores. It was more of a, a cultural analysis of the way the automobile, automobile has shaped the American landscape over the uh, 20th century, which was not over, so it's three quarters of the way over at that point. Uh, but, uh, of course, to make a narrative film based on a, what was a nonfiction uh, critical analysis book or essay uh, meant that there had to be uh, a character at the center. So the, the motorist played by uh, character actor Richard Marcus, you see him on the right here, uh, is driving this car across the U.S. and talking to himself or entertaining himself with memories and thoughts and um, things that go back to his childhood and, and uh, lots of different things. And um, that's, the, that's the structure uh, of Motorist. So um, there were, I had written a 20-page screenplay, but there was a lot of improvisation involved um, on top of that. And uh, for example, the car actually broke down when we were in Arizona. Uh, had to have a gas, uh, the gas pump replaced, uh, the fuel pump, and so we built that into the film, and we videotaped the tow truck towing it into the nearest town. And so I'm going to go on to the eighth and final project. <clears throat> The Anfar Media Van version 08 time capsule. It was a collaboration, of course, of Doug Michaels having died in 2003. And this work was uh, curated by Rudolf Freeling at SF uh, Momo short, shortly after he arrived from uh, Germany. I met him uh, at an uh, exhibition at CCA. 
and there was a, a, a flyer for uh, that featured the media van in a in a uh, vitrine, and Rudolph said, "Does the media van still exist? <laughs> because I'm I have an idea. I have an exhibition I'm working on. It might be I might be able to show it in some context." And um, I said, "Well, you know, it might still exist. <laughs> I'm not sure." And it didn't. But uh, we had done these projects in the '70s. Um, that first one was um, like an interview project for uh, related to the, the mayors, uh, people running for mayor of San Francisco in uh, probably 1972 or 74. I'm not sure which. And then this project. Uh, was also connected to the idea of the media van, but it was called the Truck Stop Network Master Plan. Uh, the idea being that um, in the counterculture, so many people seem to want to be nomadic and live in, in vehicles or modify vehicles that they could live in and actually travel around the North American continent. And uh, so, this is a uh, basically a recreational vehicle park proposal, uh, but one that has offers services of a community of a commons, uh, including you know some sort of visionary ideas here. Twenty four hour video projector, these truck stops, this network of uh, these truck stops will be connected by video link. They would have daycare centers and access to computers and other tools. And, and uh, that was the idea. It was, of course, never built and maybe never meant to be built. But as part of that, we did uh, we did go out on the road in the media van in 1970. And uh, Curtis designed this uh, map that you see uh, of the US, the truck stop network map to look like a place place map. And it actually had uh, specific names of groups and things we wanted to visit along the way. Um, and the van itself was outfitted as, you know, a mobile TV studio. Well, it was one single uh, Sony Porter Pack, uh, Jim Mayer showing here, may he rest in peace. Uh, and we did have um, the ability to play back in the van or theoretically even edit, but we didn't really edit very much um, while traveling. So that suggested that if we were going to revisit in 2008, the idea of the media van, uh, maybe, maybe we no longer have to actually physically move around Maybe because we can do it so much with, over the internet. And um, the iPhone had just come out in April or May, 2008. So we decided, well, okay, we're, we're gonna create uh, this stationary vehicle that fulfills some of the same functions, the, the uh, gathering of video information, the exhibition of video information, and is a place for people to um, gather and uh, interact. So these are, these, these are some early sketches. And Rudolph was a was a, the, the curator, but he was a kind of partner in designing the way this project um, proceeded, I think. Um, and the first thing, the first gesture we did was to remove the engine, the wheels, anything having to do with the fossil fuel economy. Uh, had to go. And so it becomes more of a neutral box. Uh, it's covered with this roofing tar just to indicate the archival nature of it. It's something from the past, but it's also something of the future. And at the center, if you climb into the media van, and it was the exhibition was called the art of participation. So the idea was. Yes, you get in the van and uh, interact with 
the media hooker, which um, basically had an animation showing you plug, plug in your handheld device and see what happens. And the media hooker would grab a file from your, let's say you had an iPhone, it would grab a file, it would show it to you, it would become part of a, a stream of other um, images. And then it would uh, print out a receipt and the receipt was a low, res low resolution image as well as the file name and date and, and so forth. It was creating a digital time capsule in that sense. And it accumulated over 2000 files between November 2008 and February 2009. And of course, we didn't really know how to preserve it as a time capsule. So we, we did some research, we talked about this, we thought, well, maybe exhibiting it is one way to preserve the idea of it. And we had an opportunity to do that at Southern Exposure Gallery in uh, opening their new space um, in uh, October. So what you're seeing here is, is a, a transparency that displays every file that had been collected by the media hooker. hookup. Two channels of video, one being the discovery of the van that was a fiction and the other being its final resting place in a co-location facility, also a fiction. <laughs> and uh, at that time, it had the media hooker had the capability of, of grabbing music files as well as uh, picture files. So it was able to play, be put in playback mode uh, and create a slideshow that would have a music track of, of accompaniments. And also originally the, the media van was kind of an exhibition space. So we turned the, uh, the placemat into a menu for uh, a DVD and you could, uh, a viewer could select along this road uh, any of these titles and view them. Um, this is a shot from uh, the Walker Art Center show, Hippie Modernism. Uh, Costale Hilton is the video playing, and maybe seven or eight or ten people could squeeze into the van and and watch all uh, this what was then uh, archival historic video. These are the media van contains its own archives, and these are the titles, several of the titles that are available in the media van for viewing. So um, there there were. Uh, Six exhibitions, San Francisco MoMA in 2008, through a final exhibition in 2016. So the project had a duration of uh, eight years. And for that uh, exhibition at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, the media van was housed inside a made in situ uh, inflatable structure. So you had to first enter the inflatable, then you could enter the media van and make a donation. There was also this little exhibition of some of the other ant farm time capsules, including the citizen's time capsule. <coughs> but each time, at each location, the media van had collected these files and we realized that each time we would outfit a hard drive to collect the digital files and those, uh, that medium, they keep, kept getting smaller and smaller. So when the catalog came out and the catalog wasn't ready in time for the exhibition, but was post exhibition, um, we decided why don't we put the time capsule itself in the binding of the catalog. And that's what you see here, the diagram. And so that the buyer of this limited edition version of the catalog becomes the custodian of the digital time capsule. And that is the long goodbye <laughs> to the automobile. But wait, there's an epilogue. Uh, and um, the Tailfin era, which is where we began the 1950s, uh, this is a symbol of the end of that idea. It's the 1958 Packard Hawk hardtop coupe, only 588 were made. It was the last Packard 
uh, model uh, ever. And I, I went on to do other work because I got interested in uh, the cr climate crisis that we were obviously looking at. Um, this is uh, Venice underwater, and these are a series of, of video works. Uh, that was 2013. I had read uh, Elizabeth Colbert's Sixth Extinction in 2014. And um, that same year, I was invited to attend the uh, Anthropocene campus in Berlin um, and kind of realized, you know, now maybe I like trees more than cars. Maybe I should be looking at trees rather than cars. Uh, and this book is a fantastic account of a uh, by a woman who is an uh, uh, expert in the subject, but um, it begins from her childhood uh, experience where she was introduced to uh, Celtic forms of wisdom uh, in native um, Ireland. And <clears throat> then I went on and made uh, uh, a video work about Miami Beach Miami Beach Elegy, suggesting it's not going to be there forever. Um, this is a few years, of course, before the condominium collapse. And um, I'm now uh, completing a, a version of 15 Minutes in Phoenix. Um, so <clears throat> just a, a, a brief view of some current or recent work. But I'm going to end here. And uh, these are places you can find uh, more work. My video works are available on Vimeo. You can follow Ant Farm on Facebook, my site, chiplord.net. And I'm, of course, I'm on um, Instagram also. But now we're going to open the floor to, to questions. All right, thanks, Chip. That was great. The uh, Chip, I'm seeing uh, the first one I'm seeing is um, uh, a, a question about how how was the van moved? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's a great question. You know, once we took the wheels off, it it had to go on to uh, dollies, and um, and that was how it was moved. So it was moved by hand by pushing uh, on dollies. And or on a truck, and you know that that, that underlined the fact that it was now an artwork and not a uh, uh, a vehicle. And I, I see uh, Serena Warner, former student of mine. I mean, while we're waiting for the questions come in, I, I have a I have a question. I'm curious about the um, time capsule, the Vista Cruiser. I know it was supposedly going to be undug in uh, 2000. Um, are there any other plans or thoughts of, uh, of digging up in the future? Uh, you know, it's interesting because uh, in, in 2000, they were very difficult. They were not communicative at all. But recently, I heard from uh, a curator at, uh, in, in the area, and he sent me a magazine article with a kind of um, a small release or small circulation uh, literary magazine, but there was an interview with the current and new director of Art Park, and she mentioned the uh, Citizens Time Capsule, and she actually says in this article, we're going to bring it up. <laughs> One oh. of these days, it will be unearthed. <laughs> so that's a very exciting development, and I immediately sent her an email and made contact, and uh, but it's not um, that's not a plan, but it may it may happen. Um, and that would be great because uh, the you know the previous and farm time capsules uh, included uh, one that was a uh, refrigerator uh, done in 1972 and it had videotapes in it 
the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston was opening a new building. And as part of the, uh, the festivities, they commissioned us to, to videotape the, uh, each of the artists and make interviews with them. And um, that went into a refrigerator with other things. Well, we, we never specified how that refrigerator should be stored. And it was in the building, in the storage area, several years later, when there was a flash flood in Houston. And there was a, a, the loading ramp went down one flight to the, not really a basement, a partially submerged space, which was the storage area of the museum. And the time capsule floated around <laughs> in it. And uh, the, uh, then it was taken to Marilyn Oshman's house. She rescued it and it sat there for several years. And then it was rescued again. And um, you can see the opening of that time capsule on, if you still have a DVD player, on the Ansarm video DVD. This was made for the, uh, in association with the Berkeley Art Museum exhibition in 2004. Okay, we have another question in here. Vivian asks, did you continue architecture practice among all these projects or transfer over to academia entirely? Well, um, there were several architectural projects done um, during the ant farm period of time. And one was a uh, remodeling of a house on Telegraph Hill. It was a very small project actually, remodeling a kitchen and um, and then after the end of Amphar Curtis and I did another kitchen remodeling uh, for a family in Pacific Heights. And I recently ran into uh, that client and she said, you know, we, we love that kitchen. It was done in the early 80s and uh, still, still in use. So yes, there were, but, you know, I always think, um, we didn't really have a business plan for continuing. And there were a number of experimental architecture groups, you know, it, the, coming out of the, uh, the 70s or during the 70s. And uh, only one of them was able to make that transition, I think, into a kind of commercial architecture practice. And uh, that wasn't Ant Farm. So, uh, but, Curtis is available for kitchen remodeling. So if anybody out there is interested, you can um, easily find me on uh, online. Okay. Um, Cheryl's asking, are you interested now in what cutting edge architects are doing or do you still find the fine arts more interesting and possibly more important for our future? Yes. Um, I, I had the opportunity to teach a class at CCA in the architecture uh, program in 2019. It was a um, optional studio and I co-taught it with a former uh, student of mine. He had been a student undergrad at UC Santa Cruz and he went on to, uh, to Harvard and got his degree there. And um, that was very, uh, exciting to do that and be engaged with this new generation of architecture students. We, we gave them the problem to design a, a monument to species extinction, could be one particular species or multiple species. And the idea was to do it on the site of uh, the parking lot at uh, the ballpark. It was a huge, it's a huge parking lot, as you may know. But during a month into the project, the Giants announced their development plan. And suddenly the only available site was also what was going to be a parking garage. So we told the students, now you have to design a monument to species extinction as part of a parking garage, which I think is a wonderful idea. And, uh, but, um, there were some great, great projects that came out of that. So, uh, yeah, I'm not totally up to date on uh, the architecture world or the avant-garde architectural world, but um, 
I'm still engaged to some extent. And and the uh, and my co-teacher's name is uh, Matt Waxman. Okay. Um, here's a comment by uh, W. U. Says uh, the van would be a great parklet. Hmm. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Darlene asks, uh, enjoyed your video Auto Parts 1979 with you and Phil Garner. Was that the Bay Bridge you were driving on during the performance? Uh, that was uh, called Auto Parts and it was done electronically. We were sitting still and I think it was, it was the Bay Bridge in the background that we were driving across. And I don't know, it's, it was more of an experiment in uh, Oh, the technology, but also uh, misunderstanding of language, I think. Uh, Pippa is, will be uh, the subject of a, a, a one person show, and I think it's about a year from now. And uh, she is, lives in Long Beach and has the gallery representation in LA and does shows there periodically. Um, continues uh, a, a form of her work, which is kind of a critique of often of uh, the automobile. And yes, I would I would be interested in documenting other versions of bidding goodbye to the automobile here in San Francisco. And actually, I, I ironically, just a few days ago, I got an email from somebody in France who uh, was writing me to tell me, tell me about his project, which, which was uh, he had owned a Ford Fiesta in Europe for many years and it could no longer pass inspection. And he decided he would return it to Detroit so he had not seen uh, motorists, but uh, it, there were so many kind of parallels between this project he was engaging in at the present moment and and what motorist was about, which was uh, which was really uh, selling this classic American car to a Japanese buyer. And at the end of motorist, you see the buyer, this young Japanese man played by Toshi Onuki uh, driving the Thunderbird through the streets of Tokyo, which we couldn't afford to actually send the car over there. So we shot it in Chinatown <laughs> and tried to edit around, you know, the kind of the Chinese characters on the signage behind him. Um, it's, uh, it's available on, uh, on Vimeo uh, for full length version, which is 60 minutes. Okay, we have a question from Dorian. It says, hi, as an artist, how do you feel about being critical about cars? I think about the paradox of Diego Rivera when Henry Ford or his son, who order him to draw the mural in the Detroit Institute of Art and his strange position between being critical against cars and at the same time answer the order from Ford. Yeah, that's Dorian is the, the uh, French man who I just mentioned. <laughs> uh, and after I got his email, I sent him an invitation to, to watch this talk. It was lined up pretty well. Uh, I, I'm interested in, you know, complicated ideas and not providing simple answers, but I do think that um, the 20th century belonged to the automobile and the, obviously the 21st century will not. Uh, I don't believe that electrification in the kind of numbers of world uh, worldwide automobile use is going to solve climate change. And I wanna mention the name River Simple. It's a car manufacturer. Uh, in Great Britain, and they're working on the assumption that the entire car should be recyclable, and the company that manufactures it should have the responsibility of recycling it. And it will be hydrogen powered vehicle. The prototype is very small, um, so it's not going to solve all the transportation issues. 
Uh, but I think that's, that's, it's a model of where we should go. And uh, it, it's going to mean also reshaping lifestyle and not, um, not just hopping on a plane for, to go somewhere for a weekend whenever you feel like it. Because there are costs to that kind of uh, movement. The, the energy costs are, are huge. So that's my two cents on, on that. But, um, you know, the Cadillac Ranch will have its 50th anniversary uh, next year in 2024. And uh, you're all invited. It'll be on June 21st at Cadillac Ranch, 2024. Well, we'll see you there, Chip. <laughs> <laughs> if not before. Thanks. <laughs> right. Oh, thanks for the invite. Um, and thank you, everybody, for um, tuning in with us today. Um, if you don't mind, I do actually have a question for you, Chip. Clearly, you have a, a huge body of work, and I'm just curious, um, and you couldn't fit it all within the hour presentation today, and I'm glad to see that some of the inflatable uh, was shown in the end where it was encompassed with the van, so that was nice to see. I am curious, though, why you decided to leave out House of the Century, which is one of my very favorites, and I thought the, the eternal frame was really interesting as well. Um, any reason why you just did not include it or it was just too much? Well, because uh, this was more about the automobile at the center of the project. And so the, the house of the century is architecture. And, um, you know, I, I can, obviously I can do uh, a separate presentation about architecture. Uh, and and uh, the eternal frame, uh, seems to have a car at the, at the center of it, but I think it's really more about reenactment and revisiting uh, that cathartic event. Um, so, and it's a, it's a collaborative work too. So it's a little bit more complicated uh, to present. And that, that's why those two were, were not shown today. That makes perfect sense. Um... Let's see, Stacy has a question. Would you be interested in documenting other versions of bidding goodbye to the automobile here in SF? Um, she does leave her email contact if you would like to do so, uh, which we can forward that to you, Chip, if you can't see that. Um, okay. And Morgan asks, what is most important in life? <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> that's a you have good answer you, you have answers for us chip we want to know good luck with that <laughs> i know <laughs> yo ask mr natural <laughs> uh, trees yeah. maybe trees right yeah trees that's right trees uh go out and kiss a tree today or hug a tree that would be my advice that's what's most important um, there's so many, so many things are important in terms of the climate emergency that we're uh, now seeing. And, uh, you know, there's so many entry points to do more artwork that um, questions and, and contributes to the dialogue around climate change. Um, yeah, so I can't be more specific than that. That's that's the subject, and um, I, I, good luck with that too. Okay, and we'll take this final question here uh, from Nancy. Um, she's asking if you've ever had any connection or interest in mobile projects going on in the UK or Europe, including Archigram and the Interaction Arts Trust in London. Well, of course, Archigram, of course, was very influential when I was a student. And that was uh, the beginning, I think, the, their publication, although somehow their, the specific Archigram, which was the name of the publication initially, became the name of the group. 
that never got to my library uh, in New Orleans, but uh, still the images that the scene that they were creating, you know, uh, were so far ahead of their time, you know, floating screens and uh, mobility, walking city, these are conceptual ideas. And then, so I think, you know, we were among uh, the number of architectural, say, let's say alternative architecture groups that were sort of following in the footsteps of Archigram. And um, I like to think that we, you know, diverted more away from architecture than that they did. They were still, uh, you know, sitting at drafting tables, I believe. Uh, <laughs> but um, not a critique. You know, I know that all of those partners have go on, gone on to have uh, architectural careers, either in architectural education or in, in buildings. So, um, yeah. And, you know, now it's much easier to follow, let's say, what's going on in the UK than it was uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, long time ago. Okay. Thank you so much, Chip. Um, My pleasure. Yeah, that was lovely. Um, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, this is this has been recorded so and we'll push that out to all registrants um, at some point and probably upload it onto our YouTube channel and uh, Chip has put his contact or contact information or his uh, I'm sorry your website. Um, if you guys want to explore further and do please come in and or place holds on his uh, books and media that we have at SFPL. So thanks again. Thank you, Stephanie. And I'm I'm very easy to find uh, online, so uh, you can you can get my you can find me on Facebook and find my email very easily. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. bye.